watching the Catholic Family Podcast, Sundays with Father Dennis. Straight talk and real Catholicism from Father Dennis Chacoin, a true pioneer of the traditional Catholic movement. Most of you here have made retreats before, I'm sure, and days of recollection, but just a brief reminder. The purpose of a retreat is to pretty much do the same thing that businessmen do out in the business world. It's to kind of run a check on oneself. If a man were in business and his company was failing, he would get together with other people in the company and try to determine what is bringing the failures about. And most normally at meetings that take place like this, they find the problem and then they correct the problem and then the business usually rectifies itself. Well again for a retreat or as today a brief day of recollection it's much the same thing except we're striving to check ourselves out in the area of our living according to God's holy will. And one of the important things to do at a retreat or a day of recollection is not only to recognize the problem but to make some resolutions in that area or in those areas. So again, keeping that in mind, we find ourselves, by the grace of God, here together in this chapel, in the presence of our Divine Lord, first of all, thanking God for the fact that we're Catholics, because it's only by the grace of God that we are capable of recognizing the truth and to persevere in living that truth. But at the same time, we live in an age that is so very unique and so confusing that it's not enough for us to be Catholic now, but we must take the steps necessary to persevere in our efforts to remain Catholic and to die as members of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> we also know that another reason we are here is because of our Blessed Mother and the role that she has played in your life and in mine as mediatrix, as an intercessor, because again, we're reminded as we were just reflecting during the meditation that Our Lady has a very definite role to play. And in the degree that we allow our Blessed Mother that role or that we go to her as our Divine Lord wishes for us to do so, then we're going to benefit spiritually. You remember that was a very important part of the request of Our Lady at Fatima. When Our Lady said, my son wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. God wants his mother honored. It certainly doesn't do him or give him any honor if she's dishonored. So again, in the degree that we pray to Jesus through Mary, that we give to Our Lady her proper place, then also in that degree we receive some very special graces. And again, I'm sure that's the very reason why each and every one of us is here today in this chapel. Keeping this in mind, let's reflect on something very basic in so far as being a follower of Christ is concerned. When a divine Lord came on earth, we know that he came primarily as the promised Redeemer and Messiah. We're told by the saints that he could have simply uttered one prayer and our sins would have been forgiven. He could have simply said, Father, forgive them. He could have shed one tear, it would have been all over. But our Divine Lord had this also in mind. Knowing the weakness of fallen human nature, he realized the need for people to have an example to imitate and to follow. So not only did he come on earth in order to say a few prayers for us, or shed a few tears for us, or even to die for us on the cross. But he came on earth in order to give us an example to live by. Our divine Lord said, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. So we are supposed to be making an effort to imitate our divine Lord. You remember how the Father, and we read these words in scripture, several times they recorded in scripture, said this, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
Now, was the Eternal Father pleased only on those few instances that it's recorded in the scriptures? Of course not. He was always pleased with Christ. Why? Because Christ always did his holy will. Whether he was eating or sleeping or talking to someone, performing miracles, or simply as a little child carrying out his ordinary daily duties. The Eternal Father could always look down upon Christ and say, I am well pleased with him. You know, some people mistake being holy, or they reduce being holy to simply kneeling down and saying one's prayers. Well, that's a very important part of someone's life, right, if they're striving for holiness. But if a man is married and has five or six or seven children, a woman's married, has five, six or seven children, they can't kneel down all day and pray. As a matter of fact, sometimes they find very little time to pray, especially if the children are small. And at times a frustrated mother or father could say this, my gosh, I don't even have time to pray. I'm not pleasing God. Why? I'm taking care of these kids. How can they not be pleasing God if they're taking care of the children? That's part of their daily duty. So again, we have to reflect on this. Everything that I do from the time I get up until the time I go to bed at night must be pleasing to God. In other words, the effort must be there for me to try to please God in everything that I do. Imagine someone sitting down for breakfast and saying, I'm not pleasing God because I'm eating. Or I'm not pleasing God because I'm doing such and such. God wants us to eat, to survive. Even recreation, part of a normal, wholesome nor development in the life of a child or an adult, to have some recreation, some wholesome recreation. We shouldn't be ashamed of what we do when we recreate, that is, unless we're doing something sinful. So then, keeping this in mind, let's reflect on these words of our Divine Lord. If we profess to be followers of Christ, shouldn't these words make an impression upon us? My kingdom is not of this world. Just a short sentence. But it means a lot, doesn't it? St. Louis Marie de Montfort tells us that the spirit of the world consists essentially in the denial of the supreme dominion of God. We are the creatures, he's the creator. And he came on earth, again I repeat, to teach us how to live. As creatures, what should we be primarily interested in? The things of the world? Absolutely not. Why not? Because our Lord says, my kingdom is not of this world. We weren't created by Almighty God for this world, we were created by Almighty God primarily to prepare ourselves for eternity. To know Him, to love Him, and to serve Him in this world as a preparation to be with Him forever in heaven. Do you remember what happened to Lucifer? When he was reminded of the fact that he was a creature and that God was the Creator? whatever that test was that the angels were put through. Instead of Lucifer saying, Fiat, thy will be done, Lucifer said, I will not serve. Now when someone disobeys God, they may not say these words per se, but in effect they're saying pretty much the same thing. In effect they're saying, well I don't care what God says, I am going to do such and such. And St. Louis Marie de Montfort tells us that the spirit of the world manifests itself by sin and disobedience. So what happened to Adam and Eve when they refused to obey the command of Almighty God? Yes, they were deceived, but God gave them a command, didn't he? He said, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. But the devil came along and said, well, you know, the reason he said that is because if you do, you'll be just like him. 
Now again, we don't know exactly what took place, but you could imagine Adam and Eve saying, hmm, gee, maybe we should. Again, forgetting the command. He simply said, don't eat of that fruit. Why did he say that? Was there something evil with the fruit itself, per se? No, he was testing their obedience. And it really boils down to just this. When we sin, we disobey. St. John Marie Vianney says this regarding sin. He said, sin is the assassin of the soul. The sin shivers down your spine when you think about it. When someone sins, they kill their own soul. Spiritual death. What a price to pay for an unlawful pleasure, for a short period of gratification. We must avoid, if we're followers of Christ, any person, any place, or anything that may bring about spiritual death. And I would say, especially with children, this is what most frequently leads children astray, their association with bad companions. You remember how it used to be taught in Catholic schools that Children should not associate with those who are not of their faith. Why? Because someone who was not of their faith, who was well versed in their error, could actually lead astray. Someone who was not well enough grounded in his or her faith. Did that mean that you hate those not of your faith? Obviously not, just the opposite. You pray for their conversion. But again, you apply that not only to one's faith, but to the way even a member of one's own faith may act. You ever hear parents say this, or maybe you've said it to your own children, every time you go out with so-and-so, you get in trouble. So the parent says, I don't want you to be with so-and-so. And again, this is something that has to be recognized. Associating, going to places that are an occasion of sin. Put in practical terms, hanging around the bars. Being with people who tell dirty stories, who take God's name in vain, who gossip. Again, we have something very precious when we're in a state of sanctifying grace, and we want to preserve it. Have you ever been into a museum where they have precious stones? I remember going into one of the museums in Europe where they had relics and precious things from centuries past. And the whole place was filled with burglar alarms. We were told if you even lean against the window, the alarm's going to go off and you've had it. The guard will be there. Oh, how careful are men when it's preserving, when it comes to preserving something precious in a material sense. But again, how very lax we can be when it comes to preserving something that has to do with the spiritual. Our immortal soul, the most prized possession we have. And the devil certainly knows that more than any one of us, because unfortunately he's lost and he's jealous. He envies you and I because we still have an opportunity to save our soul. And he will do anything and everything to take it away from us. And quite often he uses human agents <laughs> to bring that about. When we consider as Catholics the choice that we have, here's what the battle literature is reduced to. Catholic principles versus the world. Again, my kingdom is not of this world. Pope Pius XII actually said that during his lifetime, he felt that times were worse than when the Great Flood came about 
and wiped everyone off the face of the earth except Noah and his wife and their children. Pope Pius XII was in reality a prophet in our times. He has written extensively on all of the moral issues that people are facing today. If you can find the writings of Pope Pius XII, read them and reread them. Again, he was a prophet. As spiritual father of all of the Catholics, he could see the dangers that they were exposed to. And he lamented the fact that too many were falling into the trap. We're involved in a battle which is taking place between the spirit of Christ and the spirit of the devil. You remember when Almighty God, when our divine Lord allowed himself to be tempted by the devil? And you remember when the devil took him up and said, if you adore me, all of this will be yours. What was the all of this he was pointing to? The world, the power of the world, the pleasure of the world, the riches of the world. Unbelievable, but that's his kingdom. And again, we either belong to the kingdom of Christ or the kingdom of the devil. Have you ever experienced this? Hear someone say this, or do you ever say it yourself? Someone says, how are you doing? How are things going for you? Pretty good. You got a nice job, new car, brand new TV set, and you start naming off all of the material things you have. An answer to how are you doing? And again, that's the natural thing to do for human beings. It probably would floor us if we asked someone, how are you doing? They said, I'm in the state of grace. And I have the sacraments every week. Wow, where did he come from? Where did she come from? And yet in reality, isn't this the most important thing? We have a meditation that, a series of meditations that we read at table with the religious during the Christmas season in the new year. And it talks about that very thing. The only really important thing is the salvation of our soul. If an individual made an effort to further himself or herself in the business world and they failed, you know, 10, 15, 20 times, total flops, but they wind up in heaven. Successful in accomplishing the purpose for which they were created. Not that we should go around and try to fail, but just to get across a point. On the other hand, if someone succeeds in business and they wind up in hell, what good is that? What good would it do if a man suffers the loss of his immortal soul? You ever read about Alexander the Great? I think he was 26 years old when he conquered the world and there was nothing left to conquer, so he was weeping. Nothing else to conquer. He had the whole world. Still wasn't happy. He was miserable because there was no other world to conquer. And yet the saints who possessed nothing were so happy they couldn't even put it into human terminology. When we reflect on the world and what it means, the spirit of the world, we think of terms like pleasure, a life of ease, Riches, power, popularity, and the most dangerous of all, my will. Do you ever hear little children say that? Boy, I can't wait till I'm 18 so I can do what I want to do. I can't wait till I get out of school so there'll be no more teachers telling me what to do. I'll be free when I'm 18. Free to do what? There's always someone to tell us what to do, right? We'd be 90 years old, we have the teachings of Christ, teachings of the church, laws of the land, the just laws of the land. And again, that's our lot as human beings. If we did just what we wanted to do, we'd go straight to hell. 
Because quite often those things that we naturally want to do are not pleasing to Almighty God. That's why we're told by Christ and His saints we must hate ourselves. What does that mean? We hate that part of us that is in opposition to the will of Almighty God. Have you ever experienced this? You knew someone and they seemed to be halfway decent and you don't see them for 10 years and then you find out, my gosh, they did this and they're in jail and they did that. You say, oh my gosh, how could he do that? He's human. And if he wasn't praying, he was only doing what human beings normally do when they don't pray, they get in trouble. They see something that they don't have and they want it, so they steal it. They try to steal it. Again, that's human nature, trying to gratify and satisfy self. When we think of Christ and the Spirit of Christ, what do we think of? We should be thinking of prayer, penance, sacrifice, mortification, and God's will. Our Divine Lord said, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me. That's the whole purpose of His earthly existence, to show us how to live by doing God's holy will.